Thank you so much, guys. What a joy it is to be in the presence of the Lord. Shall we open with a word of prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, with a sincere desire to hear from you. Lord God, we open our hearts unto you. Drop your thoughts, your desires in our heart this morning, Lord. Mold us in the shape and image of our Savior Christ. Holy Spirit, as you minister us, we submit ourselves unto you, God, and we give all glory to you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I've already started hearing sound of chocolates being used, chocolates being chewed there so that's good hmm I wish hold on <laughs> can we come to the word of God and may I request you may I request uh, Disha if you can please show us Genesis chapter 22 verse 2 please Genesis chapter 22 verse 2 and uh, this verse says, Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And I'm sure you must have been reminded that this word is something that we have seen week before last. And uh, we had seen... Uh, we were studying on the word worship, and we were especially seeing how, how he has been asked to offer on one of the mountains. And uh, we were trying to understand that Sunday, the Sunday before last Sunday, how Abraham took this act of offering as worship. And the definition of worship from Abraham's point of view was so clear that we could see is to offer something to God. That is the true worship in Abraham's point of view. And so when God had asked Abraham to offer his son, so Abraham uses the word that he is going to worship when he is talking to the two men who had helped him to carry wood and fire. And so this act of worship which Abraham is doing is something that I want to bring again before you. And today the... Another view that I want to bring before you about worship that we find in this verse is on the basis of the word wherein he says, take now your son, and then he adds these four words saying, your only son, Isaac. And those are the four words which I want to bring today before you to understand worship better. Dear brothers and sisters, we have seen that worship does mean to offer. And over here, if we see Abraham, Abraham has been offering God now and then different cattle and lands because he has built several altars. Whenever he had heard from God, wherever he would want to worship God, to honor God, he would build an altar and he would offer different cattle before God. So he was in the act of worship. But now there is something special that is happening. This time it's God himself who is asking Abraham to offer something. It's not Abraham who is choosing to offer God. Because last time when we were studying the word worship, we had taken the reference of Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2, how God asks us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God. And we had seen the whole chapter 12, how Paul helps us 
to understand what exactly we are expected to do when we say that we have to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. We have seen how it applies in our work life. We have seen how it applies in our church life. We have seen how it applies in our family life. We have seen how it applies in our society life. Because worship is not limited to a time frame. It is not limited to an action. But it is applied to every moment of our life. The moment, since the moment we are saved. Right then, our life, I was saying, even our breathing is a way of worship to God. We, there would be few people who would struggle. I do not know to sing. I do not know to play some instrument. I do not know to preach. Or I do not know to do certain things. But I want to tell you, in God's kingdom, everyone is valuable. And even your breathing, even your talking to someone, smiling at someone, a gesture to a, an alien person, you do not know how God can use that. And that's a way of worshipping God. You do not belong to yourself. Do you know that? You have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. You do not belong to yourself. And once he has purchased you, now you are his property. So it's not what you think matters, but what he plans matters. And in his plan... And in his purposes, he knows how to make best of the least things. That's wonderful. <laughs> we, we need to get used to different voices other than amen. There can be different ways of saying amen. I, I remember the verse which says, uh, wherein it is written, If not you, the stones will praise. So if not you, the balloons will praise God. So everything, even if you blow a balloon, that is a way of worshipping God. Amen? Amen. Yeah. But the thing that I want to bring before you today is more close to God's heart. And I say so because this time what I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to show forth you through, through this verse is, it's not... Abraham who is choosing what lamb he will offer to God. It's not Abraham who is choosing what cattle he will offer to God. But it's God himself who is choosing what would he want from Abraham. And that is next level of worship, my dear brothers and sisters. We do spend our life for God, as Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 tells us. That we offer, we wish to, and we desire to offer our life as a living sacrifice unto God. We try our level best that every action of ours will be a worship to God. And that is so commendable, that is so good. But I want to let you know that there comes some moments in our lives wherein God is expecting something from you and from me. When God in himself is demanding from you and me. And when that happens, that actually shows that there is a big plan of God for you and for me. We will see what God does when he asks or demands something from a man. When he is asking Abraham, Abraham, I want you to do something special for me. And that is, that is actually showing a close relationship of a man with God. Because till now, man has been offering unto God in his obedience, in his submission, in his admiration. You know, he is offering to God everything. And that is so good. That is something we all are expected to do. But look at this now. There comes a moment when God himself is speaking and saying, Son, daughter, this is what I want. And the moment you and I get to hear that, I am sure our heart 
should be excited. Our heart should be so much full of thankfulness that you have allowed me to be in a stage wherein you ask me to do something, to offer something. That's, that's such a big, big privilege. But that's a way of next level of worship unto him. Worshipping not only from my ways, not only from my lifestyle, but worshipping the way he wants me to do that. And that is where we need to move to. That is where we need to push ourselves to. That is where we need to prepare ourselves to. That is where we need to keep asking, keep asking Holy Spirit, lead me to that place wherein Father himself will ask me, what am I supposed to offer you today, God? And once I know that, what a privilege it will be that you can offer that because that is what his heart desires. That is what his heart desires. In this case, when we read, probably you may, you may think, oh well, that sounds good, that God himself is asking man to offer something to him. And but then, Avish, can you see what is he asking? Man, that sounds scary. Because he is asking while reminding him whom you love and your only son, Isaac. He is reminding him that you love him. He is reminding him that he is your only son. But now, Abraham, I want you to offer that to me. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to bring some examples from the Bible wherein God has actually asked human being, man, to offer something to him. And the more we see it will be easy for you and me to understand what type of things God can ask. Are you ready with me? So here we see, here we see God is asking Abraham to offer his only son and the son whom he loves very much. And obviously, he is the son whom he got at the age of 100. At the age of 100. He got Isaac. And now when he is a young adult, God is asking him to be offered as worship, as an offering. Well, let's come to 1 Kings chapter 7. And if you see from verses 7 to 16, but we will see, we, I will ask Disha to please show us verse 9. 1 Kings, if you can open your Bible, 1 Kings chapter 7. Verse 9, please. There you go. Thank you so much. So if here, if you read from verses 7 to 16, you will come across an interesting incident. I'm sorry. That's not the right verse which I'm asking for. But I'm asking for the verse... Uh, the passage which speaks about Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. I think I'm giving you wrong reference, and that's why Disha is showing that. Is it 17? That's right. Yeah, 17, 7 to... 16 then and verse 9 will give us what we are searching for first Kings 17 verse 9 thanks Tash 17 verse 9 and verse 9 so this is what God is speaking to Elijah because there is a famine and uh, uh, he, he needs to be fed. And this is what God says to him. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belonged to Sidon, and dwell there. Now then he goes on to say, and this is interesting, See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So God has commanded this widow to feed you. And now we know 
I'm sure you must have been reminded about this story, about this passage, that this widow about whom God is speaking, she is with her son, only son, and all that she is left with is enough flour to make one roti and some oil. And she is cutting wood there, and that's where Elijah comes, and he asks for water. She is about to go to get water, and he, he says, would you mind getting something to eat for me? And she explains to him, excuse me, sir, you know what? I am left with just a little bit of flour, some oil, and my plan is, she explains that openly to him, and my plan is, we eat that, and then we die, because we are left with nothing else. That's the only thing that is left with me for me and my only son. And now, when this man of God hears this, what does he say? He says to her, go and get that for me. <laughs> go and get that for me. For God will provide you till the time there is famine. Just go and get that for me. Now, standing here as a father, I, 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 I just cannot empathize or get into her shoes to know what she must have felt then. She is having just enough for herself and for her son. And she is pretty clear that once we eat that, because we will be left with nothing, we are going to die. So at least we are going to live for one day. And this man of God is saying, forget about that day, give that food to me. Can you see that? But the interesting part is, this lady about whom God had spoken to Elijah, this lady was commanded by God to give it. And in obedience, she did give that to Elijah. And once she gave that, the Bible is so clear and telling us, if you read further verses, till the time there was famine, they did not lack anything. God provided them food all the days of those famine. But here, here comes the point. God is asking this woman to give the only thing that was left with her. The most necessity, necessary thing that was left with her. The most valuable thing that was left with her. God is demanding that from her. Praise be to the Lord that we get an example that she did give that. And we know what happened when she gave that to him. Mm. Let me give you another example. Let's come to John chapter 6 verse 9. John chapter 6 verse 9 please. Okay. So this is what Philip is telling to Jesus. Because Jesus has asked. Feed these people. Because there are 5,000 men. And their wives and their children. And I don't want them to be left back. Uh, sent back empty. And I want them to be fed. And Philip is inquiring from people and comes back with a report. You know, Lord, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. I purposefully picked this verse because it gives us all these words. Small fish. So barley loaves, if you see historically those days, they, they would have these loaves of a size of a palm in which they would keep a small fish, you know, just wrap it and eat it. That's, that's, that's what he is talking about. So he had such five small barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? And who had this? A chap, young chap. And probably his mom had given him as, as a lunch box. That was the only thing that was available for him. And he is a young boy. Bible tells us that Jesus had been preaching them the whole day. It was so long, such a long day, that he said, if people go back without eating, there is a possibility they may fall, they may faint. So everyone must be hungry, including, including this young boy. He must be 
really, really hungry. And all that he had was five loaves and two fish, which he would like to have before going to home. And here comes Philip with this information to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Go and get it and ask all the people to sit in groups. So Philip goes to him, to this young chap, and says, Excuse me, young man. Oh, yes. Would you mind me having your lunchbox, please? <laughs> what? <laughs> this is the only thing that I'm left with. I'm hungry. I have not been able to eat anything because Jesus has been preaching the whole day and I wanted to respect him and I did not eat in front of him while he was preaching. I saved this so that once he is done, then I can have this. And what are you asking for? Oh no, the Lord is asking your lunchbox. And what did he do? He just gave that. The only thing that was left with him, the only five loaves and two fishes that were left with him. Something that he really, really needed. But God is asking that from him. And we know he gave that to Jesus. Those five loaves and two, bread, uh, f two, two fishes were given by him to Jesus. If you see Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. So, here we read about this man. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, and, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. True. Next. 19. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Okay. Verse 20, 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat, of, boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them and verse 22 says, and immediately, immediate response was, they left the boat and their father and followed him. We read about these four brothers, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, who were in the profession of fishing. And Jesus is saying, today while you are fishing, tomorrow I'm going to ask. So this is the journey of Peter from being a fisherman to being a feeder or taking a shepherd of sheep. Jesus is asking them to give up what you are doing and follow me. And these four men, they left immediately and followed Jesus. And similar is the story of Matthew, the Levi, the tax collector, who was asked by Jesus while he is collecting tax. He is in the office. Jesus is passing by. He looks at Matthew and says, Matthew, follow me. Leave that job and follow me. And this guy, he leaves that job and he follows Jesus. A source of earning that was enough for him and his family. We know at least about Peter that he had wife and he had mother-in-law. He was taking care of them. But here comes the moment when Jesus is saying, leave that Follow me, I will make you fisher of men. And these men, they left that. What they knew was the only thing they could do. Was the only thing that they could do. But they left that and they followed Jesus. While going through all these examples, there, is, there are in fact two more examples wherein voluntarily it was done. Let me, let me just take you to that as well before moving ahead. Let's see Mark chapter 12. Verses 41 to 44, please. Would someone like to read that for me? Mark chapter 12. Who will read that for me? Mark chapter 12. Please, someone read. Disha, would you mind switching that off so that someone can open the Bible and read? Mm -hmm. Chapter 12. 
Now read that, Daniel. And Jesus now sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and said, Unto them, Verily I say to you, uh, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury, for they all cast in of their abundance, but she... Out of her poverty. Out of her poverty. She of her... cast than all that she had even in her living yeah out of her body in all that she had her whole livelihood so she has given everything that she had and every time I read this passage this is just me every time I read this passage I feel man you know what Jesus has an eye on how much you're putting in that bag because <laughs> <laughs> just out of topic but this is what is going on here this woman, she had put just two coins and Jesus is calling his disciples and appreciating what she has put because he is, he is very clear in telling that she had put everything that she had for herself, her entire livelihood she has given and, she, and he appreciated that. And one more personality, if you can see First Samuel, first chapter, First Samuel, someone else, if can read for that for me. First Cham Samuel, first chapter, twenty-four to twenty-eight. First Samuel, first chapter, first chapter. Twenty-four to twenty-eight. Yeah. So this is Hannah, who had prayed to God one year before, and God blessed her with this child, and as per her promise, now this is what she is doing. He was the only child that Hannah had. She comes over, and she hands over this son to Eli, the priest, and says, hereafter, he will be here with you to serve the house of the Lord. And she hands over that son to him. What I'm trying to bring before you is, my dear brothers and sisters, the examples that we have seen. In every example, these are, these are the few examples wherein you see that God had asked man to offer something to him. He had asked Abraham to offer his only son. He had asked this widow of Zarephath to offer the only flour and oil that she had to him. She had asked Matthew, she had, uh, God had asked Matthew, he had asked uh, uh, Peter, John, James, Andrew to leave the only profession they knew and follow him. He saw what this woman, this widow in the temple was doing, what she had when she had offered, he appreciated that. What am I bringing before you is... This way of worshipping God, wherein we come to that level, wherein God demands something from us. You know what he's going to demand from you and from me? With all these examples, one thing that I can surely see is that anything that is the most dearest and the most valuable to you is going to pick that. And he's going to ask you from that, for, for himself. And he's going to say, give that to me. Give that to me. The most dearest, the most necessary, and the most valuable that you have, 
God would like to have that for himself. For himself. But one thing that I want to bring before you before we move ahead is that every time he asked anyone to offer that and everyone who offered that to God, they never received minimum. They always received maximum. They always received in multiples. Every example, every example that we are talking about you will see that God returned back in multiples. And there is a reason why he does so. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me show you that. If you come back to Genesis chapter 22, and if you, if, if you read, uh, uh, let me read for you verse 16. I'm coming to Genesis chapter 22, and I'm reading verse 16. 15, uh, 15 onwards. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, because you have given it to me, and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants. So in this case, because he had given his son, it is multiplication of descendants when the women had given flour and oil there was multiplication of flour and oil when peter john james andrew matthew they gave their life we know how much multiplication god gave in their lives so every time anyone has offered what god had asked from them Every time in the Bible you will see that God has given them back in multiples. In multiples. I do not know if there is someone whom God is asking to offer something that is so, so dear to you. It's not every time the eldest son or eldest daughter. No. We know the example of Jacob. He, it is not. But someone who is so dear, something that is so valuable to you, God may one day put that in your heart that I want this. I want this. And I want to encourage you today. That would be one of the best moments of your worship life. That would be your best moment of your worship life. Because the moment you offer that to him, the one guarantee that I want to give on the basis of the word of God is that you're not going to lose it. You're not going to lose it for sure. On the contrary, you are going to receive it in multiples. In multiple. So do not be hesitant if that opportunity comes into your life. If that position comes into your life. That you have that desire in your heart. That I should offer this unto him. Just go for it. Because the more you do that, the more you will see blessings in your life. The more you will see multiplicity, multiplicity in your life. Because that is the promise of God. That is the promise of God. Now... You may wonder, is it something that he may ask? But if you, if you look at the example of, uh, example of Matthew, if you look at the example of Peter and his brother Andrew, or James and his brother John, you will see they had given their, their profession unto the Lord. Now, not every time he will ask you to leave that profession and follow me. But there is also a possibility that he will ask you, the profession that you are involved in, give that unto me. Being there. You being there, give that unto me. What am I trying to say? Allow me to explain it more in, in simple words. Being in a job, doing that job as if, Lord, this is to worship you. This is to bring glory to your name. This is to bring, bring honor to your name, God. I do this job so that I can praise your name among the people whom you have put me. You know, offering that unto God. Just giving that unto God. If you are among such relatives who are troublesome, offer that unto them. Offer them unto God and, and see what God does. And see how God blesses. See what God does when he intervenes in any given situation. The moment you hand over unto him, if he is asking something, if he is asking something, do not hesitate. 
do not hesitate. I, me, me, me and Monica as a family had come across a situation few years back and one verse that God was speaking to her has just helped us to stand strong on that. And, and this, this verse uh, is, is from Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 1. If you can see Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 1. See this promise. Cast your bread upon the waters. The bread over here is the most dearest thing of your life. It may be your profession. It may be your spouse. It may be something that is very close to you. It may be one of your lifestyle. I do not know something that is so much valuable to you. And this promise says, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. And when you find it, you will find it multiplied. You will find it better. You will find it refined. You will find it more blessed. That is the promise of God. And, and yeah, this was the dream that Monica, Monica or, or rather the vision that, that she had seen. And I'm j just taking this opportunity to, sh to share that with you. She saw herself in a boat with me. And in another boat, she sees Jesus. And when she sees Jesus, she is worshipping Jesus. And Jesus looks up to her and says, Give a wish to me. Give a wish to me. And so she starts uh, talking to Jesus and saying, How can I give him to you? He is the only one that I have. He is the only one whom, who, whom I love so much. And, and he is the only one who provides. He is, he is the only one that I have. I cannot give him. I cannot give him to you. And Jesus is just standing on the board and he says, just believe me, cast your bread. And this verse comes to her. Cast your bread on waters. For you will find it after many days. And in that vision, she just, with much reluctance, she literally pushes me towards, towards Jesus. But that, that was the time after which we literally saw the change in ministry, the change in our family life, the change in our relationship, the change in everything, everything. Nothing remained same. Nothing remained same. So I stand here as a testimony, as, as, as a testimony that this word is true. Anything that is so dear to you, when God is asking that from you, that moment of worship is a special moment it's a special moment don't miss that if any time god asks you to do that because there's a promise matthew chapter 19 verse 29 matthew chapter 19 verse 29 what's the promise matthew chapter 19 verse 29 would anyone want to read? Yeah, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. You shall surely receive hundredfold anything that you have given for his kingdom, anything that you have given for, for him as a gesture of worship you will surely receive hundredfold. And no wonder so many examples we see that no one lost anything, but they received hundredfold. And, and often I come, I come to this part wherein when Jesus had asked this young man, young rich man, when he comes to Jesus and says, what do you want me to do so that I can have eternal life? And you remember what Jesus said? Oh, these are the Ten Commandments. Don't you know those Ten Commandments? Just follow them. Just do that. And this young man says, Oh, well, I've been doing that as a young lad, young chap. I've been following them. and I'm, I've been doing that. 
Oh, well, there is one thing that you can do. Go, sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Right? That's what Jesus said. And what's the next verse? It says, he felt offended. He felt sad because he was rich and he left. Now, given this situation, this is just me. I'm wondering if in case he had said, okay, Lord, now that you are saying to me that I should go and sell everything and then follow you, and if in case he had sold everything and distributed it to the poor people and started following Jesus, what would have happened? What would have happened? I'm so sure of my Jesus Christ. The one who keeps his word that, man, he would have become rich more than what he was before. Now, how that would have happened, that's up to Jesus. But for sure, in very short period of time, he would have become much, much richer than what he was before. That's my Jesus, who gives this promise. Anything that you give, you will get back hundredfold. You will surely get back hundredfold. Now, There is one more thing that I want to bring before you. If you see Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. Right. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Fine. Next verse. Concluding that God was able. Now this is important. God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So Abraham is receiving Isaac in a figurative sense in the form of resurrected Isaac. Okay. Three days before, God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to offer your only son Isaac. Cool. Okay. Next day morning, he picks Isaac and two other servants and he started walking. How many days does he walk? Three days. Right? Three days. So, Abraham, the moment he heard from God, he has in his mind already sacrificed, offered Isaac to God. Because he had that in his mind, he could ask Isaac and two other men to walk with him. Otherwise, he would have never been able to do that. He would not have been able to do that unless he had in his mind already offered Isaac to God. And now he walks. Now when he is asking Isaac to sleep on the, to, to lay down on the, on the altar, he already knows that he is dead. But he believes that now my son is going to be resurrected. This is the time when I am going to see my son resurrected. So, from your and my point of view, that moment of offering is a dreadful time. That his son is going to get killed. But for Abraham, he is excited because he knows this is the moment when he is going to see his son resurrected. Are you getting me? And that is the reason his language, even to the, to the men that wait here, we will worship and come back. To Isaac, on the way he says, God will provide. He knew that. He believed that because he has already offered Isaac to God. Now is the moment, he is looking for the moment when Isaac will be available to him in the resurrected form. And that's what this word is saying. He also received him in a figurative sense. In a figurative sense. My dear brothers and sisters, what I am trying to tell you is, if there is anyone among us to whom God 
asks us to offer something that is valuable, that is so dear to God. Know that when you offer, you receive back the resurrected form of that same gift. And the resurrected form has abundant life in that has abundant life in that. Let it be your job, let it be your child, let it be your life, let it be your spouse, let it be anything. The moment you offer that unto God, He gives you back in the resurrected form. And the resurrected form speaks of abundant life. And you will receive that abundant life in that offering from God Himself. That's what is worship. When I offer unto God, He gives back in the resurrected form to you and to me. Amen? Amen. There is one more angle to this, this, to this verse 22, verse 2. It says, let me bring your attention to one word here. From Genesis chapter 22. Verse 18, chapter 22, verse 18 says, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Right? That's what God is saying to Abraham. Because you have obeyed my voice. So, If you come to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 9, where we read about this widow of Zarephath who had offered food to Elijah. These situations, these situations are so tricky. They, they, you know, when we read these situations in the Bible, we, we take them as, oh, well, this is in the Bible, and this lady could surely do that. Just take a moment and put yourself in that position. Do you think that would be that easy? Are you with me? Do you think that is easy? Even you take, take example of Abraham. Offering his own son. Do you think that is easy? Thank you. At least there are few who are saying that no. For others I am considering it's okay for you. Yeah. You are going to give your offer your son to him or daughter to him. Even for that young boy who was asked to give five loaves and two fishes, two, two fish, do you think that would have been easy to him? And in all these cases, I mean, only one case wherein this young chap who was rich, he did not agree what Jesus demanded from him. But all other cases, all other examples, I have tried my level best to check out throughout the Bible if there has been any other situation where God asked for something and what was the feedback, what was the response. These are the examples and it's only once that I read that someone did not do what Jesus asked or God asked. Otherwise, every time they did that, whatever we are asked to do, and then my question is, Lord, if I am there, you will have to surely help my faith. I am not that strong as these guys are. I will find it pretty hard to give anything. Good that you spoke to Monica. If you had spoken to me, I wonder what would have been the story. You knew whom to speak and you spoke to the right person. And we, we find that resurrected life, we find that blessed life. But, but I know it's, it's, it's pretty hard. And therefore I want to let you know something about the government of Holy Spirit. The government of Holy Spirit works in these ways. Like what is written here. Oh, we are into another verse. In Genesis what we read was, Because you have obeyed my voice. So obeying God's voice is crucial. If God is asking me to offer something, now the, the, the most important element is obedience. Now how, 
Lord, will I, will I be able to obey you? Will I be surely able to obey you if that demand comes before me any day? Will I be able to obey you? What, what can I do so that if that demand comes tomorrow, I will obey you? What should I do? How can I prepare myself? What is there that I can do? What did these guys do that they were such obedient people to you? I don't want to miss that. Now after understanding that there is so much of multiplication and blessing, and, and I would like to obey you, but it can be hard. It, it, oh, you know what I'm trying to say? So what, what am I supposed to do? My dear brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you. That's where Holy Spirit will come into picture. And he has two ways, after seeing these examples, I came to this conclusion. There are two ways that he does. One, he will prepare your heart to obey. When that, when that demand comes, he will surely prepare your heart to obey. And if in case you find it hard, because you and I are in fallen state, you and I are dust, he does Remember that. And in that case, you know what Holy Spirit will do? Remember this. He will bring situation in your life that other than being obedient, you have no other option. Yes. Uh, very good point. Believe me. Yeah. Believe me. That's Holy Spirit. That's Holy Spirit. Most of the times, if you are someone like me, he will have to work in the second style. I confess, I confess, but I know this dear Holy Spirit, He will create situations in your life that other than being obedient, it's like, it's like checkmate. Have you played chess? If you play, play chess, there's a position where in checkmate, there is no move, you're caught. Hand over, submit. Okay, no option. That's what Holy Spirit does. He will create situations in your life that other than being obedient you won't be able to do anything how good that is how good that is thank you holy spirit for you know us so well amen, yes, amen. Yeah. let's close our eyes then Bernie, would you mind leading us in concluding prayer, please? Father, we thank you. We thank you for what we've heard. We thank you for you asking us for those things that are close to us and dear to us. And we know and we agree that uh, we would have difficulty in providing. Thank you that your Holy Spirit makes it possible. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that's come down upon each one of us today and that's here right now. Thank you as we walk away into our homes, into our families, into our week's work, that you will go with us, that you will bless us, that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit and we obey. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence with us today. Amen.